Okay, we're starting back again at 707, which is really 737 AD, because in this section you have Second Advent language. Okay, we saw it in Matthew, and the question was, why does it occur as it did in Matthew? And I tried to explain that. So then the question is, well, that was really because the Bible was being preserved, people were moving west, and as it were, the appearance and the actual word, wording in Luke is down here. The, the so-called appearance of the Son of Man, well, when you're learning Bible, it's like seeing him when you learn it enough. So this becomes a kind of metaphor. I mean, it's literal for the literal tri tribulation to come. But at the same time, until that time, because this is a timeline, it's got a satire element to it, and God is not above satire, sat satirizing himself. And in this case, the satirization is <clears throat> twofold. By the time you get down to 749, which is really 779, during the time of our boy, Charlemagne. But just so that you know, the... The, the metaphor here, when you see all this talk about signs in the heavens, you know, and the, the, and the sun, and the, and here's the moon, here's the sun, and the stars, okay, it's talking about spiritual tumult. It's talking about a great deal of migration, spiritual tumult. The Bible is moving, okay, for good and for bad. It's got both connotations to it. The same thing when it's talking about the Son of Man coming here in verse 27. That's all Second Advent language, but in a way, the, the God comes to you when you read Scripture. So it's really emphasizing the movement and the impact of Scripture on the area during this time. Hold on, i got to turn off the heat. So that's how you read it metaphorically before the literal application of it. So this time that ends at 707, which is really 737 AD, is saying, look, this is a this is a tumultuous thing, you know, and especially for a Greek, when you see this kind of language in your Greek plays and stuff like that, it is talking about something that's going on really in heaven that has an effect on earth and so they use astronomical language for it okay so this is a very familiar metaphor in Greek to Greeks in their literature and they always understood that it means something behind the scenes in heaven to them it was the pantheon of the gods but you know Luke's writing about the real one and it's talking about the angelic conflict. This is really important to the angelic conflict. The Bible be free, and it's moving, and it's moving west. Now, on top of that, when you go look at history during this same time, starting about 696 through 737, you can see the movement of people. And they're also moving west. You have a whole bunch of peoples of various kinds that had started moving west a couple centuries earlier. But there are new waves moving west at this time. Groups of people coming from the, the Asian steppes. Groups of people coming from the Caucasus. Groups of people coming from up north, go, moving directly south. You have the Vikings that start up during this time. And, of course, coming up from the bottom, you also have movement also going west and north of the Arabs, okay? So, this is the time of all of this confluence of movement, and it's all going in the same direction toward Western Europe, okay? Now, in Western Europe during this time, you still got, technically speaking, the kids of Clovis, the the Merovingians, okay, and they had a, a cultic 
association with their kingship. And it, it was very much based on the Bible, but inaccurately based on the Bible. Okay? The long-haired kings is what they're called. And they basically were asserting a divine origin, like kings often do. And they were trying to, you know, create a cult of personality. And it was an admixture of pagan ideas and Christian ideas that they used to sort of gain power. And, of course, Clovis had converted to Catholicism, so you had all that going at the same time. But it was a mixture that, you know, when I say that the Bible interest is rising and that people are taking their Bibles with them, that doesn't mean that they understood it. That just means that they were interested. And just like new baby Christians will do, they have all kinds of goofball ideas about what the book said. Okay? But they're learning it. Maybe just a little bit. But there's a widespread interest in it. And the only way you go from being goofy at the start, okay, like I mentioned when I was first starting this, you know, series on Luke, the only way you go from, from you know, being goofball to, to being really mature is if you keep that interest in Bible going. And then gradually you learn, oh, I thought that blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's not true. It's a different thing in the Bible. And you slowly get corrected as you go along. But if, honey, if you don't have the interest, I don't care if you got every single doctrine perfectly right, and of course you won't. If you don't have the interest, it's worthless. Just words in a book. Okay? It has to be driven by interest in God. But it is driven by interest in God. Everybody and his brother during this time is... You know, they got their definition of God goofball or the doctrines goofball, but it's God that they're interested in, even the Muslims. Okay? When you even, I mean, Islam is really founded on a mercenary ideology, a mercenary and, what do you want to call it, criminal ideology that tries to tell itself it's holy. But it's got the word God in it. And you know what? When people hear of God, they don't know that the book that they're hearing about is goofball. But they're interested in God, and this book has God's name in it. So I want God. And it's that kind of innocence mixed with goofball that prevails. And that's what's going on here. Okay? You have people moving from the Russian steppes. You have people moving from, you know, the northern part of, of what we call Europe now, way north coming down. You have people moving up from, you know, the Arabs moving up from the south, trying to get toward, you know, um, Spain, and they actually managed to take over Spain during this time. Okay. And it wasn't called Spain then. It was just, you know, a bunch of little principalities. And they're taking them one after the next, after the next, after the next. And Catholicism, you know, was a big influence in Europe. And it it wasn't the Catholicism we know of today. Okay, it was really just, well, we're calling some guy in Rome Pope, and then we just believe whatever we want with this Bible we got, pretty much. You had a lot of monasteries being built, and a lot of Bibles being copied and disseminated during this time. And so when you got the Arabs with the Koran mixing with the people with the Bible, you got a lot of goofball ideas all mixed together. And nobody really knows that what they believe is not in their own holy book. But they put God's name on it, and it's a child's emotional attachment to God. Okay, but that's interest. So that's why this is characterized with a 91 by the time of 737. And then you got the Battle of Tours which is occurring um, five syllables prior. So, Kai Salu is three, and Talasas, which is really interesting. Okay, so, Lasas. Lasas, Kai Salu, five syllables. Okay, so, Battle of Tours is right here at Ta. That's really cute, because in the Bible, the word C, which is what this word is, the word C is used for politics. Okay? 
the movement of people as as waves of you know war or waves of migration or waves of interest or waves of this you know such that it actually forms a kind of culture for the time okay well that's exactly what was happening in the battle of tours was in particular the sea of the christians versus the sea of the muslims and it you know battle of tours is kind of like central north in what we call france today so they've gotten pretty far up, the Arabs. All right? And Charles Martel is the guy who stopped them. Or he's the guy who's credited with stopping them. Charles Martel was a mayor of the palace, which means that he was effective ruler of the territory that they then called France. And he was technically underneath one of the, car one of the last... Um, Merovingians at Childeric, I think the second or something. And you know, at that those at, in those days, the 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 rulers, the last of the Merovingians, were really weak, like the last of the Western Romans. So he was effectively in control, and his son, Pepin the Short, will actually end up becoming the king after the final king, who is Childeric the third. Okay, and that starts to happen all during this time. After the Battle of Tours, Charles Martel effectively kind of pretty much unites France. He was having trouble with the Angles and the Saxons and the Jutes, and the, those were people coming up from, from Northern Europe who we like to sometimes call the Vikings. They, they weren't necessarily Vikings, but they ended up becoming the population of what we now call Britain. And so he was he was fighting with them or agreeing with them, and they were settling in or they were pillaging, and it was all this stuff going on. So that's why you have this language, signs of the sun and the moon and the stars. Believers are called stars. The angels are called stars, the elect of God, okay? The signs of them, okay? And And this is also a metaphor often used like in Revelation 12 for the Jews. And one of the things that happens during this time is that the Jews find a kind of sanctuary here. Okay? Especially under Charlemagne, that will come into full blossom until he goes nuts in, what is it, 18, 8, 14, just before he dies. But he was mostly pro-Semitic, and he inherited that, of course, from, you know, his own family, and Charles Martel was his grandfather. Okay? So at the time this is going on with Martel... Charlemagne, as far as I can tell, wasn't born yet. Pepin the Short was the son of, okay, Charles Martel. So all this is getting ready. And then to, to, to give you a better sense of how the time plays, okay, when Charlemagne comes in, in okay, you got, you got, oh, all men are anxious and afraid about what, what's going to come now with expectation of what's to come. Okay, well, what's to come is the end, all right, of the old period where the papacy had had so much control because one of the other migration movements that was going on during this time was a people called the Lombards, and they basically move into Italy, okay, and they sort of like wall off the papacy from having any effective control. And that's why this is considered to be so important because there's a certain freedom now that's happening in Upper Western Europe. Freedom because they're able to defeat the Arabs from coming any farther. And then, of course, you know, Charles spends the rest of his time going back down south to, to wipe out the Arabs. And then he's got other tribes he's dealing with, okay, to, like, unify the territory. And that's basically what's going on. So by the time you get, see this is 779, by the time you get to this, the dun and dunamis, this means power, okay, first syllable of it, that's when the grandson, Charlemagne, is crowned king of the Franks. And by the time that occurs, the kingdom of the Franks, 
is pretty vast. I mean, it's going, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, operating from memory here, but it's basically all of what we know is France. It's extending far westward toward Germany, okay, and far south to, like, you know, what we consider the Pyrenees, all right? Because there were the Basques that they had to deal with. There were, um, you know, still renegades of various forms that, that you know, they had to fight. And that's pretty much what Charlemagne does, you know, from 768, which is right here, um, definitely for the next 14 years, definitely through 779, okay? And that ends up being a gross period. And one of the reasons it is, is that um, Charlemagne's dad, Pepin the Short, the first, of the, Carol the first of the Carolingian kings, he had done an awful lot to consolidate the territory of France, what we call France. Um, and one of the things that's distinguishing about him is that he was really hung up on, really just wanted, um, Bible and was a good friend of Boniface who was the um, sort of Pope that's still down in Italy sort of under the control of the Lombards but Pepin managed to free up a lot of the you know the sort of oppression that um, Boniface was facing um, from the Lombards and we didn't get all of it done Charlemagne will finish that off and so what ends up happening here, and another reason why this kind of language with the, the sun and the moon and the stars is being used, is that right here, after about 34 years, let's see, 779 is 21 syllables in. It's 31 syllables, so we go count back 10. Should be here at this next dunameus. Dunameus kai doxis poli. Okay, well, one more syllable back, the, the me, between the me and the ta. That would be 800. 800 AD, I want, it might have been 801, so maybe it's after the ta. Um, as a sort of, well, it's a two-handed thing. Um, the Pope, and I don't think it was Boniface by then, the Pope who was down in Italy, was so grateful, that was a nice reason, um, for Charlemagne's help that he comes up on Christmas Day, either in 800 or 801, to crown um, Charlemagne king of the New Rome, Holy Roman Empire. Now, on the Pope's part, there was a darker motive. The darker motive is to try to assert control over a king again. All right? Or is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right here. That's 779 right there. He, he won, you know, he, he lost everything. He ends up being, you know, a, as it were, under the thumb of the Lombards. He gets freed by Charlemagne. And instead of merely being grateful, he wants to sort of exercise a little bit of influence and power and authority over Charlemagne. Well, Charlemagne lets him think that he had that, but he doesn't. Charlemagne still stays in power, and in fact, Charlemagne executes a number of reforms which are not really all that biblical, but he didn't know any better at the time. Um, he starts exercising, as it were, rights over the bishops and rights over the economy and rights over this and rights over that. Because, you know, he knows very good and well, he doesn't want the papacy controlling him. So on the one hand, what he's doing is overreach. But you can sort of understand why. And on the other hand, um, what he also manages to do is to, you know, what do you want to call it? He wants, he wants people to learn. Okay? He wants them to learn how to read and write. He wants them to have literature. He wants them to have art. He wants them to have an education. And so all those monasteries that were, you know, from Charles Martel forward, okay, from Charles Martel and his success at Tours here, although they actually started earlier, um, they're freed up to really just proliferate. 
And of course, that's what our boy Charlemagne really wants. And so he institutes a number of reforms, many of them we would call um, socialistic today. But remember, this has been a period that has been in war and war and war. It had like at least a hundred years of, you know, derelict Carolin, um, Merovingian rule. And plus it's got all this movement of people and stuff like that. So he's a little too dictatorial. But given the time and the nature of it and the fact that he wanted to get everybody educated, um, and he's therefore, Charlemagne is considered the father of Europe. Um, that kind of explains why this language is so flowery, okay? People were afraid of what's to come. And then, oh, and then will appear the Son of Man right here. Well, Charlemagne is actually crowned as Holy Roman Emperor here. He's been king, you know, for a lot longer than that, ever since over here. And you'll notice we're playing with the two dunamis words, okay? Um, but as far as the word of God coming to the common man, to call it Christ coming, well, yeah. Okay, 1 Corinthians 13 talks about Christ's head. His head getting into your head is the whole theme of the book of Corinthians. It's in 1 Corinthians 1, 5 in the Greek. His words are in your words. So his head getting into your head, that's why Christ coming to you, okay? And you, you can sort of understand why the language would be so flowery. Plus, you got this very charismatic king. And, you know, as far as people are concerned, this is like heaven on earth. Hold on, I got to... Take a break.